大家好，谢谢大家耐心等待。我今天呃，这个会议呢也来了非常多，跟当时的呃马来亚、呃、马来亚事件有关的一些人员啊、呃、朋友，还有当时当时的参与者，所以我先特别要欢迎他们来感谢他们。呃，我先从广州呃远道来参加这个活动。
because you had joined a communist guerrilla army unit in our home village. I learned how you were eventually executed in July 1949 by the nationalists, just two months before the communists declared victory over China. Your side won the war, but all that remains of you is a monument in our village to your martyrdom. And this photograph, which our relatives handed to me as the only thing you had brought back with you from British Malaya. It was your prison photograph. It bears your detainee number. Your eyes seem to have lost the luster they once had. Painful as it was, Oda's uncle began to open up. We found old family photo albums. In one picture, it looks like you were in your high school volleyball team. You were squatting in the front row, first from left, posing as if you were trying to keep the hairy mole on your left arm in the shadows. I now know that mole was how your body was identified from amongst the corpses in the man's grave you were left in after execution. I now know in the 1930s you had been a school principal and then a leftist journalist and photographer in Northern Malaya. You were a community leader and by all accounts you were an advocate for social justice. Like most overseas Chinese who still cared for China, you and grandma did theatre in the streets to raise money for the anti-Japanese war in China. You were arrested and waterboarded by the Japanese for this. They hung you from a tree. You survived and continued being active in politics, culture and intellectual circles. When the British returned after the war, you were part of a wave of anti-colonial sentiment. You made anti-British speeches. You became the chief editor of a leftist newspaper in Northern Malaya and published anti-British editorials. As the winds of the Cold War were blowing everywhere around the world, you were arrested by the British who had declared emergency rule in Malaya as the communist-led resistance grew. The guerrillas in the dense jungles across Malaya sabotaged British rule and the tin and rubber supply that the British relied on from its prized colony. The British solution to this was to round up 35,000 leftists like you and deport you all to China, whether you had been born there or not. That's how you ended up in China. It was an all-out war in every way but name. The British called it the Malayan Emergency. It was a war that lasted 12 years and left families broken and traumatized. History is often written by the victors and this trauma became buried with time in the bodies of my uncle and other families like ours. I wanted to understand this trauma, this amnesia. I wanted to understand you, the political choices you made, the fire you had in your belly. I traveled around southern China, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Thailand and Singapore to do oral history interviews with other Malayan leftists whose lives paralleled yours. They fought against the British and got deported or exiled. I met men and women now well into their 90s who were the foot soldiers of what they saw as a just national liberation revolution, like with so many other places in the third world at the time. I asked them why they wanted the British out. I asked them what it was like being on those ships being deported to China. I met many who were lucky, unlike you, and lived on to find good jobs in communist China. I met others who stayed on in Malaya and went into the jungles to fight to establish a communist state for the next 40 years, living in the rainforest between Malaysia and Thailand. They had their own field hospitals, 
radio station, printing press, and made their own weapons. They went on fighting for the idea and ideal of socialism. Laying down arms only in 1989. Some of them remain exiled today in the jungles of southern Thailand. They gave their lives to a failed revolution. And most of them are now fading from the scene. I drove around northern Malaysia and southern Thailand in the towns where you had lived and worked and in the so-called black areas where the communists were active, where they had ambushed Commonwealth soldiers, shot British rubber estate managers, where they had hid in limestone caves and lived with tigers and elephants in the jungles. I visited the old tin mines founded by the British and that jail where they had kept him. I went to the cemeteries of Commonwealth soldiers who were killed by the so-called bandits and communist terrorists. One of their graves reads, One day we'll understand. In our family, this buried chapter of the Cold War left grandma and great grandma to raise your five children without you. I feel I can understand the choices you made in those turbulent times of big politics. The family now thinks the genes skipped a generation, and your sense of social purpose passed on to me. But grandma, must have been very angry when she said, you chose politics over family. And she must have been thoroughly heartbroken to lose you. She never remarried. One day, we might understand. Now, let's 
the format we decided on is that we each going to say a few words about, uh, about this project today. And uh, I will, I'm going to start because uh, I need to justify doing this project in the first place with some fun. Um, and then the others will, will fill in the uh, lecture and uh, other concepts. We are one of the members uh, who were involved in the, in the emergency care. He just turned 100 years old. So, um, so the use of this knowledge is actually uh, 
um, the problems of using this knowledge are uh, being reduced to just merely political problems. However, if we rethink uh, the possibility of science and the possibility that uh, what we consider to have considered universal and, um, and probably the only part of truth and question this, then we should think um, that there are many, many alternative sciences which have existed before European enlightenment. And many of them actually have worked, and some better than European sciences. For example, a lot of people who use Chinese medicine today realize that there are many cures which can be explained only with a different body system. Um, and that body system, until now, is still not recognized by many, many hospitals, in fact, probably most hospitals, even in China. So, um, decolonization has another aftermath, which is decolonization of knowledge. And decolonization of knowledge means that there are many worldviews, there are many cosmologies which can produce alternative approaches to what we have today. But a lot of them have been raised, um, like the memory of Qin's grandfather. Um, they have become politically incorrect. They have become a uh, wrong path to take. And today, we still face this demise, struggling to reassert um, some of these cultural histories. Of course, some of them are purely uh, cultural. For example, until today, we call China year 2000. 19. But I, um, but I contest this thing. I think there should be the People's Republic in the 70th year. Um, just like the National Government uh, started the first year of the National Republic in 1912. So by taking charge of history, taking charge of historical narrative, um, colonization was started here. And, um, and today, we're still living through the aftermath of the solutions to the world wars, the solutions to the empire. And these solutions involve these different ideologies that have been used to combat the iniquities of empire, capitalism, and exploitation. But in fact, the problems are in the solutions themselves. And we are now living within these solutions. And there's that difference. And I'm very grateful to Chen for having brought this us so that we can open up discussions on issues which are not just on, um, on um, uh, certain political rights or certain ideological disagreements and we should rethink this whole problem of, of empire and colonization from a wide perspective. Um, well, I've risen on 10 minutes, so <laughs> I'll pass this on to uh, today's speakers here. Mark Tay has come a long way. First time in Hong Kong, so I won't be welcome. Thanks, thanks very much for having me. Uh, and you know, thank you to Chi for this uh, wonderful and really moving exhibition, and also the performative reading just now. Um, it is my first time in Hong Kong, and um, you know what a privilege to be here within the context of this exhibition, but also with the events that are unfolding um, across this week. You know, there's just many layers. Um, where, as I think Johnson has already kind of intimated, where the past really kind of overlaps with the present uh, within the walls of this gallery and outside the walls of this gallery at the same time. So thank you very much. Um, I've written some comments, so from time to time I might refer to them. Um, I, as, as I mentioned, I'm primarily a performance maker and theater director. I make documentary performances. And I've been working around this similar topic or subject matter of familiar emergency for the last uh, 15 years. Um, so when we encounter these landscapes, uh, people, and these objects that she uh, has, has been working on you know, for, for almost the last decade, um, it really brings back a lot of very complex and layered uh, feelings for myself, as you can imagine. Um, and to see them through someone else's uh, eyes, see them through a very sensitive lens. Um, I, I, I think what really strikes me in these images and, and the videos, uh, you, which you, some of you might get a chance to see uh, later on in the next week, uh, is this 
notion of um, fluidity and fixities, which are very interlinked. You know, um, we forget maybe that um, during the period of the Malayan emergency, not just in Malaya and Southeast Asia, but in many parts of the world, Africa, Latin America, so on and so forth, um, between the 40s and 60s, this was really um, uh, a place and a time of great uh, changes uh, and great freedoms. You know, empires uh, were ending or maybe going through a reincarnation. Um, uh, new nations were being formed, created, amalgamated, and in some cases also being partitioned all very quickly in, 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 uh, in, 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 in succession. Uh, and what strikes me is that um, you know this was a period when the dual body of the nation state really emerges. You know where borders come into play, where territories are marked by boundaries and mapping uh, fixes uh, and creates nation states, along with other technologies like the census. In Malaysia, you know we are divided today according to our racial identities. You have the Malay, the Chinese, the Indian. And uh, others, basically anyone who we can't like fix up to the other identities, you know, the purple people, the green people, the pink colored people, that, that are all of the others that are all lumped together. Um, and of course, these racial census uh, is also a kind of colonial technology, colonial governmentality. Um, and it over also overlaps in the notions of medicine and science, if you want to go back a little bit. What we should remember against these fixities that are being created by colonial empires inherited by new nation states like uh, Malaya or Malaysia um, that the elites took over and in fact concretized these systems were the fluidities that actually everyday people felt and went through and experienced and lived. You know, um, of course here we're talking, I, I'm, I'm very much reminded about the uh, very broad spectrum of even what counted as anti-colonial, um, revolutionary uh, ideologies in the 40s to the 60s. You know, um, and we must remember these were very young people. <laughs> they were in their teens. They were in their twenties. And the spectrum included, uh, you know, the, the spectrum against imperialism included people who were anti-British, anti-Japanese. Um, uh, are socialists, communists, Islamists, royalists, ethno-nationalists, um, and for a lot of these young people, um, the choice wasn't always exclusive. You know, they could inhabit multiple points in this spectrum, and it's important to remember that. But as nation states get created, um, and as new history books get rewritten, um, some of these political identities needed to be uh, externalized or exteriorized or be made into enemies because new nations need new enemies as colonial wars turn into civil wars. Uh, so this is the kind of legacy that I think we are dealing with and I feel very strongly uh, that Shigeru's work reminds us you know, and hints at these fluidities that, uh, that exist that existed and actually continue to exist under the surface uh, in our landscapes, in our people, in the narratives that are uh, still coming. Maybe at this point I will just um, close by raising uh, the figure of uh, Chin Peng, uh, who is someone I can talk about a little bit more later. But uh, Chin Peng was the Secretary General of the Communist Party of Malaya um, from 1947 uh, till 1989, officially when the Communist insurgency ended in Malaya, but he lived until 2013 um, and then passed away in 2013. Ten years before 2013, in 2003, he had published his own memoir called Elias Chin Peng. Uh, it's a 597 page poem where he basically recounts his journey, um, and through recounting his journey, through writing this memoir, he had to actually revisit himself, a kind of self confrontation because the research they get to do uh, work at, at creative in folders, classified or declassified, in all these kind of imperial context. So it's really interesting that Chin Peng, the last communist, I say the last communist because he was never allowed to physically enter into Malaya and Malaysia, um, unlike everyone else after 89, not even for a visit to his hometown. 
in order to construct his sense of self, he had to disperse he had to go in search of these dispersed documents and folders uh, in order to kind of understand where he had come from, who he was, and what landscape he wanted to uh, So it was really from 2003 that this histories begin to emerge, and there's a lot of wonderful work being done by scholars and academics, uh, not just in Malaysia and Singapore, but around, around the region. And also artists have kind of done working on that act since that time. And, um, I mentioned Jin Ping's book. I will just close this area by saying that in 2020, next year in Malaysia, maybe you could be changed government after 61 years. Uh, <laughs> uh, so next year, there is a new history book being rewritten uh, for the first time uh, under the new government. So new Malaysian history book. And of course, we know all these problems will not go away and they that way just overnight. But I think Chi's project, um, this exhibition, really comes at a very timely uh, place and really ask a lot of questions for me about what does it mean to have a homeland, is it possible to have multiple belongings, um, and, and, and many, many, many questions. I'll stop there. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful sharing uh, and thank you, Jim, for the extremely touched. Really, it's probably my fourth time. <laughs> Uh, it's close to your intimacy between the history of your personal family experiences. Um, for me, it's, a, it's always a haunted experiences. So it's a haunted experiences with a sense of eerie. Eerie constitutes two types of failure. The first type of failure is the failure of absent. And the second type of failure is a failure of pattern. I think, in a sense, the photo is an extremely appropriate term for this ontology as the moment of, 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 of possibility. The possibility for us to reconnect, or reconnect with whom, and reconnect with what. Uh, coming back to, I think, for, for um, the notion of history, history is also extremely haunted. Especially, I've been in Hong Kong the past five years. The kind of unsettled feeling of the haunted present of power was very much exposed by the huge assemblage of student movements. And that's where the power that was spoken, Big Brown, is kind of exposed itself through those assemblages on, on the street. Um, I think, in a sense, going back to the sense of history, Gertrude Stern had a wonderful way of approach to it. She once said, history is not the passage of time, but the killing of century. The slow death of a century, which century we're exactly talking about here, I'm referring particularly to the 19th century, the slow death of the 19th century, and how the slow death of the 19th century and the demise of the 19th century really became the proliferation of the modulation of the state. That's what Johnson might mention in the very beginning. This captive, endless captivation of state discourse um, in various of our everyday life. And the uncanny moment of having this exhibition open this very point of time have also the haunted street, which just past week you have the student, you have the, the civic society standing on the street. I mean, those are the moment of the captive, the endless captive of the state discourse, and how Hong Kong has been very much um, on, 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 on this particular captivation of becoming part of the state. And, and what are the resistance that they manifest to those assemblages? I think going back to this uh, slow death of the 19th century, I mean, where we come from Southeast Asia, Singapore, and Malaysia, um, what are the potentiality of going back to this almost the ontology, the ontology as a, as a possibility? 
Here I'm going back to, I would say, the image of a collective moment of imagination. Um, it's fascinating to have the exhibition in Hong Kong. We have dear friend Mark Tay sitting next to this, uh, who also has been very much working on this almost outside of the, the aesthetic of ontology by violin, via this collective readings of script historical events. So again, we're coming back to this slow death of history, the slow death of the century, and how we retreat the ghost coming back to us and standing in solidarity with the ghost. Um, to response to this ontology in conversation with those images surrounding us, um, this is the second time I encountered this body of work. The first time I was in Singapore two years ago. In that particular exhibition, we decided to show a serious portrait and the archive of the from the Malay emergency. And this time, we take a very different approach. We decide to showcase the landscape. We decide to showcase the landscape which, may I refer to it as a result of a road trip, a result of a road trip, more than one, multiple road trips across the archipelago, multiple road trips across the border as well. But back to Mark Tay's our position on the geopolitics in the body and the formation of the state borders. I mean, those are border crossing journeys you took in formation of those images. Those images are fascinating, not just in a sense the dark documentation of your journey seeking or forming a solidarity with this ghost or the absent. But those are, I would have to say, these are effective images of the landscape of hopes and wishes in a sense, coming back to the notion of the state. The state as the demise of the, the, long, the death of the long 19th century, it had been transformed into the different forms of regimes. And in some of the images, between those um, rubber plantations, the, the man-made lakes just next to us, it's very much a relationship between how culture or civilization define nature. And in this very particular point is how the colonialism is a definition of certain human beings, is the natural resources. Yeah, literally speaking, the human resources in the most violated manner. We can, the resources of artists, of the form of radical artists taking place in this very conversation. So, the most landscape will not only haunt it, but also the possibility to rethink about the notion of decolonization is very good point by forming a relationship with the landscape. So, landscape in this particular sense, with the, sh the shadow of the elephants walking across the forest in, in our left hand side. It also link back, link us back to the mother emergencies and also the moment of how what happened after the Malay talk, which Mate has a body of work on it. We go into a jungle. So it's a very interesting proposition you set up here from the landscape, which you have the absent, the failure of present, of a different formation and different imagination of the political communities which has been put into exile and which have become part of your family histories, part of your family experiences. Your grandfather was in exile, you leave the mother, his motherland home and going back to his father tongue, which is China. So, so those are the failure of absence, those are landscape, uh, representing those failure of absence. And, and I think that's the beauty of and as a potentiality of aesthetic with this haunted landscape coming back to us. And for us not reading those images just as the representation of this particular history of the, of the, of the, of the 
female political possibilities for decolonization, but reforming the relationship also with nature and other species that you project in your images, and other potentialities of seeing and of feeling of those landscape for us, which is a landscape of our everyday life, such as when, when, when this time when I left Hong Kong tomorrow, when I live in Hong Kong tomorrow when I come across to those streets just have the student, have the social movements on the street. Those are haunted moments reconnected us and that's why the landscape became such a dramatic dramatic tropes here are very effective for us to reconnect with them with our their everyday experiences. And the other ontology, another moment of ontology of this uh, ghostly collective is this notion of coming together. And for students coming together, we can co be coming together of the different possible, I would say, communities, affected communities, compared with the imagined communities of the nation state. I think maybe we can have uh, Mark Tay, which um, he almost spent one I mean, entire decade on this particular uh, project on the bombing talk, which is very much part of this uh, haunted history we're dealing with on this landscape, with, uh, uh, result of this bombing talk, and how we utilize again the historical materials, the historic, historical moment to engage with the present day struggles. Um, for instance, in 2011, you have the first reading in Singapore. And what does that mean um, to form relationship with, in Singapore, in a sense, how, what does that mean to Singapore's Singaporean audiences to form a different um, association with the past positions of resistance? Um, and what does that mean for you as a practitioner from Malaysia to have this particular uh, historical text? the transcription of the talk to be written collectively in Singapore right before the election. Maybe after um, our sharing, we can have a day to share a little bit, and also a conversation with <coughs> Jimmy on how do you think about this particular landscape while you are traveling through so many times uh, with this absence of your grandfather in your family and then as the momentum of this Almost uh, again, also more than five years, right? Five years tracing and revisiting this absence in the family or the absence of the state formation of Malaysia in the larger sense. So, a uh, short response of our two questions for the conversation. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, it's real uh, privilege to be here. So, uh, you know, I like the other. Uh, Speakers who are sort of already in, you know, in art for a long time. I'm actually this is the de my debut uh, in art event, um, primarily academic. So uh, um, and it's really nice to see you know the you know uh, Chinese, uh, this fantastic um, mission and the very good uh, evocative kind of a uh, reading of of, uh, of this uh, you know uh, leading us into this memory uh, in a very you know, aesthetic form. Um, and, and this is a really like a, a history that we, you know, barely and is sort of uh, suppressed uh, from, you know, uh, really uh, very recently, you know, first of all, I think that the reason why, uh, you know, why we're talking about uh, sort of memories and history um, like this now, I think it has a lot to do with the, you know, the political scene, uh, these kind of memory or always kind of struggling between this, you know, on the one hand you have this world hegemonic kind of um, neoliberal ideology, on the other hand you have nationalist narratives within each country, and that of course is also true in China, so even the communist revolution, which is much more uh, than the kind of nationalist, uh, you know, um, agenda that the Communist Party now sort of try to, uh, uh, try to sort of uh, position the revolution uh, to be, right? It's, it's broader uh, and it's not transnational, it's about you know, fighting for a, 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 a world uh, of uh, where you know, uh, just 
just world with, with the, uh, a lot more kind of trans transformative goals than the national uh, this agenda. Um, and so this is, uh, I think what's interesting is you see um, that for a while, a while in the last, you know, uh, I guess half century, you know, you have very standard, you know, uh, let's say, uh, memories about trauma, about struggle, right? You know, uh, that's being considered to be, you know, the, the honorable memories, right? You know, the Holocaust, um, you know, various, uh, you know, big trauma event. Um, but you also have these kind of events that are to be inconvenient um, because they are inconvenient by the standard of global of neoliberal ideology as well by the utilitarian um, sort of framing of memories and the nationalism. Um, and, and I think partly, you know, why we, we uh, these these kind of memories, inconvenient memories, sort of you know, research um, has something to do with um, you know. The challenge that this um, status quo politics is, uh, is facing, and it's a very interesting moment. Right? Um, there's a very famous quote from uh, um, from Horkheimer uh, 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 Adorno's uh, uh, dialect of environment, where he said, "All reification is a forgetting." A uh, reification uh, in the Western Marxist language means perpetuation of status quo. Right? And the idea is that, you know, it's always about uh, sort of that justification, the perpetuation, the internalization of status quo uh, involves this selective reading of memories, history, what is considered to be honorable or sacred, what is considered to be, you know, uh, uh, sort of, uh, let's say, the kind of history by that step that we see here to be in a war, these are people who were, you know, disillusioned, they, they were deluded, you know, they were, you know, we are smarter than those people, right? Um, and, and if you think about it, you know, this um, really, uh, the kind of memories have been very important in, in, uh, in the last few centuries. So Holocaust, you know, it also transformed from a, a kind of progressive understanding of Holocaust to a more tragic, uh, Holocaust as a, it's a sacred uh, memory uh, that it's a, it's a sacred evil that seems unspoken for us before and and, that about. and that has nothing to do with that with this, this new liberal uh, sort of political consensus that was dominating the last few centuries. And I think the moment we I was thinking about this, uh, this kind of memories, they help us to to also imagine what kind of politics will follow them. Um, in in uh, Marcuse, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, his uh, aesthetic dimension, but I guess this, uh, he ends with a very interesting kind of quote, uh, sentence. He said, art fights um, sort of perpetuation of status quo by, by, fighting, uh, by making the petrified world speak, sing, perhaps dance. Forgetting past suffering and past joy, alleviates life and the uh, present reality to principle. In contrast, remembrance spurs the drive for the conquest of suffering and the permanence of joy. And I think that's really the spirit that we we, we hear today, and it's the kind of spirit that we need to kind of you know resurrect. It's about you know I think art plays a unique role in making that petrified world you know, sing and dance, right? And, and I think uh, that is why it's important to also have the big voice for you, I will see later. Um, the last I think we'll go is, you know, uh, if we think about policy behind, uh, beyond well, the status of politics, then I think one, one thing uh, we need to really kind of uh, engage with is certain kind of uh, Disrection of the Christian spirit. Right? Uh, I mean, it, it, it's been sort of for a while. I think that people want to forget about revolution. That's also true, both globally but in China. A farewell to the revolution. Right? That leaves us with uh, no uh, so this part of our, uh, you know this uh, uh, groundbreaking kind of you know uh, momentum to to uh, to fight for some uh, for some change fundamental change, uh, 
I think this is uh, what you know we currently need to think about uh, respecting the revolutionary spirit um, because uh, as this the, the world we have is disintegrating, I think you know uh, often times the the right kind of you know uh, the right I guess version of populism. Uh, Tend to not be more aggressive than we do. I think we, it's, that's one reason I think we need to kind of revisit this, this uh, you know, uh, chapter of, uh, of revolutionary, global revolutionary movement, you know, in, in a new way to re signify it, right? rather than, you know, just trying to brush them aside and say this is an unnecessary sacrifice, right? Uh, and I think art plays a unique role in that uh, project. So, I want to share for now. Yeah. Mm. Well, there's a, a very rich presentation by um, all three speakers. <coughs> but maybe I should just hold on to it once and just remember too many points. Um, I think what uh, Shining also has uh, reminded us is that uh, revolutions uh, is actually not an abstract or revolution. Revolutions are always responsive to some very specific specific forces and we need to actually investigate these specific forces to find first people find a solution for the people on the ground and we see it's very simple. Um, if we are the rest of Hong Kong in last week we came from one very specific force. But of course it comes from some bigger historical um, movement um, starting with the Cold War all the way to now. So uh, how does one bring this specific that motivates action to, um, to understanding or to people uh, want to uh, uh, wider or and more universal type of knowledge that would be interesting. Yeah. Perhaps, uh, That's a really big one. <laughs> yeah, well, perhaps we can start with something specific. Sure. Yeah. Thomas made a very interesting um, reading and very deep reading into uh, Chi's work because most people come in here to say, well, we have these are good we photographs of many not not too interesting sites in nature. Um, but the important thing is all hidden behind, but it's not there. And what's been recommended. Fans gave us a very um, brilliant analysis of what does the landscape do? How does that to relate to our existence? And, uh, and also the possibility for landscape beyond the state. So, it was landscape beyond the state and the <laughs> Yes, that's beyond state and politics. Um, landscape is I mean, landscape is an interesting subject. Um, I think it's fairly it's fairly resonant or allowed us to imagine different solidarity, a practical one. Um, a few historical reference might be necessary. Um, going back to say the, 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 the film study of the uh, political film uh, in Japan, uh, then you have the collective forming after the failure of 1968 student movement by Masao Adachi and his collective. They form a particular group that is a fairly loose one, but they collectively produced a film titled AKA Serial Killer, which is another road trip, a road trip following the serial killer, a young teenager serial killer, uh, trace his journey all the way from Hokkaido, the northern Japan, all the way to the south, to Tokyo. What are they dealing with is another landscape, the notion of landscape here is the notion of following 
that lack of better words, I mean, water dynamics, uh, homogeneous empty time. So landscape in that particular historical context in Masao Adachi's aka serial killer and the landscape film movement stand for the kind of tokenization of the landscape throughout the Japanese archipelago. But as a response to the failure of also now the leftist leaning uh, social aspiration for a collective living of the post war Japan under the whole war. Thus, another landscape might be interesting to take as the you know, alternative reference point to think about different breakthrough to how landscape in itself is the embodiment of the state violence or the, again, going back to this James Scott's uh, term and this captivation of the state discourse. So, for, I think for, for Chi, it's several details in those images, the religion of the French colonial church. This is in Penang, right? Close to Penang. Um, a cave once you have British soldiers died in a, in a cave and now you have uh, South, in South Asian communities who used to be who bring by the British colonial government to the Malay archipelago as you know, we very much share experiences of Chinese Kuli to taking care of tin mine and uh, rubber plantation. So Lagos landscapes here without the presence of you know uh, without the presence of a Southeast Asian um, figure in these images but a statue of the religion statue in the cave. It's kind of a body of that trans-regional uh, migrations as part of the result of this colonialism. I mean, in a sense, in Southeast Asia, the colonialism history is probably longer than the notion of the state, which is a fairly young notion uh, in the region. So, in a sense, how the presence of the state formation in Southeast Asia need to be discussed as a process of delinking from the colonial centric perspective of low formation of the landscape. Um, I think Chin's images provide a fairly whole entry point for us to imagine this uh, potential connections um, with those state mechanisms um, inscribed on those landscapes in racial uh, segregations, categorizations of human landscape and how human turn into resources in conjunction with landscape turn into resources as well. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
have a straight landscape um, on specific things that happen in these sites or near these sites. Um, so, in, in, for instance, you know, there's um, tin mining towns hanging from these walls. There are tin mines, there are rubber plantations, there are also limestone caves where the communist guerrilla army hid before they launched ambushes on the British soldiers. There are also resettlement camps that the British constructed um, to resettle half a million people um, into these camps to cut off the supply of men, arms, and medicine to the communists. Um, and then there are pieces of jungle that were the base of the communists. Um, and then there is a piece of man-made lake which the British came up with, I mean they came up with this idea to literally flood the communists out of their jungle base. Um, they didn't get to build the dam, the Malaysian state did in the early 70s. So underneath these man-made lakes are um, villages of aboriginals that are also allegedly um, you know, aircraft runway and all the rest of it that you need to fight a war. So what I've done with this series is really to sort of look for what are not officially sites of memory, but to me constitute some kind of piece of this war that we no longer want to talk about. Um, so that was my thinking and going around making this. And this is the landscape strand in this gallery is one part of a sort of a two-part show. This room is called Remnants. So what remains, what traces remain on this wall. And then in the next room we have a video installation, which is called Requiem, which is more about the songs from this um, war from 70 years ago, sung by the participants themselves. So it's them reclaiming these memories of political participation, of you know, socialist ideals and ideas um, in their own voice. Um, yeah. And uh, maybe Mark can share a little bit more about the work he's done. So Mark, uh, I really wanted to join us here from KL, from Malaysia, because he's been working on uh, the memory of the Malayan emergency uh, for the last 15 years, and he's done uh, amazing pieces of theatrical uh, performances uh, around the Baling talks, which took place in 1955 which was sort of the first attempt to, um, to end this war between the communists and the British. And he's gotten actors to re-personify the text of this uh, agreement, which, which failed, and therefore the war went on until 1989. Mark, maybe you can speak Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try and like, um, I'll speak about the projects that I've done kind of in relation to some of the echoes that we have been speaking about for the last um, 45 minutes or so. Um, so yeah, I mean, thanks for the kind of really nice introduction of the project, uh, Chi. Um, so I've, my collaborators and I have made several documentaries and performances and, and, and projects and exhibitions uh, around the late emergency. But principally, I think I'm being asked to talk about uh, this performance called Bali, of which there have been five or six iterations of uh, since 2005. Uh, so what it really is, as a theatre show, because uh, that's what I am, a theatre director, um, is we found the original transcripts of the 1955 peace talks, these failed peace talks that took place in December of 55 between Chinpeng, the then Secretary General of the Communist Party of Malaya, and the uh, Tunku Abdul Rahman and David Marshall, then Chief Ministers respectively of Malaya and Singapore. Uh, the reason we even have these transcripts in the first place is because uh, the two-day talks were recorded by the British. So the British were not participating directly in the talk, but they, they, they set up all the recording equipment to kind of document the event. Uh, interestingly enough, um, the talks themselves take place two days before Tun Kabul Rahman, Chief Minister of Malaya, is about to fly off to London to negotiate independence with the so this talk in 55 was a kind of performative event in and of itself already. And was already like kind of audition, you know, uh, how he would negotiate with uh, principally Jinping and the communists would dictate how the British would then uh, negotiate with him when he arrives in uh, so, so this is the, we, we found a text, basically. Um, it, and we've staged various different performances 
the earliest manifestations in like 2005, 2006. Um, I I work with non-performers, uh, so you know other researchers, other other people who are interested in the subject matter. We would read sections of the talks. So I have three performers: Dinesh, Kumbhakar Rahman, David Marshall, Chin Peng. And then in between these scenes, the performers would share their own personal, familial uh, narratives, like what she had just did, actually. You know, um, talking about the experiences of a grandfather who was also uh, deported to China, and uh, another person who would share the story of how their family home was actually attacked and bombed by the communist party. So this was the very early version of this 10 years journey. And then in 2008 and 2011, subsequently, um, we thought we were done with these talks. Let's move on to other theatrical projects. But um, as it were, the situation in Malaysia was such that um, we had we had the emergence of a kind of civil society movement. The opposition began to win over the states, and we thought it would be interesting to read the entire text of the talks um, in public, inviting members of civil society lawyers, human rights activists, um, teachers, students, one or two actors, and so on and so forth. So people would take turns in public to read these words, the content of these talks. And what do these talks actually talk about? I mean, they talk about notions of loyalty, independence, freedom, surrender, uh, and all these keywords in 1955 resonating across to 2008. And of course, 1955 was before Malaya became independent as a nation. So what does it mean to talk about these terms uh, in 55 as well as in 2008? We subsequently did them in Singapore as well uh, during the year of Singaporean elections. Nothing changed. PAD is still in power, but <laughs> nothing changed. Just very briefly, the last, the last iteration of the project um, took place in 2015, two years after Jinping, the communist second general leader, died. Something very, very strange, interesting, powerful happened in our landscape um, when Jinping died. As I mentioned earlier, Jinping was considered the last communist. After 89, the only one who could not re-enter Malaya or Malaysia for a visit. He, he filed a court application in 2005, it dragged on for four years. Uh, eventually, he couldn't be allowed to come back because, and this is the technical reason, he could not reproduce physically his uh, birth certificate. <laughs> Which, you know, might have been lost somewhere in the jungle or so, <laughs> as they were writing about. So, we managed to conduct some interviews with Xing uh, And in the latest iteration of Baling, we read these transcripts of Baling, and in between, the performers would um, give their own perspectives on how they felt this historical character, Jinping, was created by the British. He was first a British collaborator, then became the Secretary of the Communists. So he actually had an OBE. This is all background. Um, but the most interesting thing, and the thing that made us finally kind of really stare directly at Jinping in the eyes, because we've been avoiding it for 10 years, because he's taboo. Uh, in Malaya, Malaysia, was because um, when he died, he, when, when, before he died, he said something very powerful. I think like his final political gesture. He said, look, I can't come back, fine. But perhaps when I die, I will be cremated. And um, my comrades or my family members can take my ashes across the border from the Thai, Thailand side, the Malayan side, back to his hometown in Thailand to be dispersed in the cemetery where his family is buried. Right? Um, and this is, this is an amazing statement, I think, because he would not be denied to cross the border. You know? uh, and of course, immediately, the, the, the Malayan population, well, it's confusing, right, Malaya, Malaysian? The Malaysian uh, uh, defense minister stationed army and police personnel along the Thai Malaysia border, and they would check people's bags to make sure no one had little plastic bags of ashes, you know, or chimpanzee's ashes, uh, or no one would stand at the border and kind of <laughs> flow them across the border. I mean, but, but this is amazing, right? Because the notion of pollution, you know, the notion of body and landscape, 
and, 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 and dust, you know, and, and what is permeable and not, um, was really complex. And for us, we, we felt we had to deal with chin pain finally. Um, and, and so this is the kind of performance that, that using the text of the volume comes, we've allowed ourselves to also update the way we look at this period of our history, um, the communists and the leftists themselves, and also, of course, ourselves, because we change over 10 years, 15 years, engaging with this material, you know, as we find out more, it gets more complex, we want to stop making it, but you kind of get drawn back into this stuff, um, and in a way, that's what dust is, right? You keep on sweeping it, but uh, it keeps on coming back. Carolyn Stephen, Scottish historian, has written a beautiful book about this very topic, dust and archives. So, so I think this is where um, my entry point really is when I come to reading, Chi and reading, and, and, and also uh, uh, the images of these lines. It's very much about memorialization and what's allowed is memorialization. I mean, for a man, maybe it's hard to understand for people who don't really um, are not familiar with this history. Um, what is it about this one man that makes his, even his ashes so potent as a symbol of memorialization of his role? Um, so I think as as art practitioners, what we're trying to do, so the state the state narrative is the one that in, was inherited from the colonial um, powers, right? The, it was a triumphant, um, you know, war against uh, the local communist insurgency, and um, those were communist terrorists and bandits, and they were crushed, and therefore the state. Um, has um, the has the power over the historical narrative and decides who gets to come back, who does not, and whose ashes gets to be buried in, in Malaysia. And, and I mean, Singapore has the same narrative basically. So I guess as arts practitioners, what we're trying to do is to complicate or destabilize this this state narrative. And I think it's interesting for us to think about um, grappling with these um, legacies of colonialism and narratives in present day Hong Kong. Um, you know, I've been talking with some Hong Kong friends about this show, and one of them was in this room, I shall not name her to shame her. But um, she mentioned to me that um, Hong Kongers, or one section of Hong Kongers, feel very strongly against communism and the Communist Party. And in fact, she said, she <laughs> like um, the But I mean, it's very, very true to me in that we have to also think about the context of doing this show here. Um, and it's interesting also for me to look at the news coverage this week and see some of the protesters wave Union Jacks. And what does that mean? I mean, is the choice really between harking back to the British Empire and the romanticism of that, or the forgetfulness that we bring with that, and um, the 400-pound the gorilla in the north, which is obviously um, waving another kind of flag. So, is, are there other things, are there, are there other ways or other paths or are these questions we should grapple with? And should should these be questions being grappled only for the former colonized or should we also be asking these questions of the former colonizers? So some of that's, those are some of the questions that I'm kind of thinking through. Uh, I mean, in fact, I haven't got a chance, I think, for audiences haven't got a chance to visit uh, the gallery behind this, which is a, um, a video, which the uh, first time I watched it, I really almost burst into tears. But there's two questions emerged from after watching this video, which is, first of all, uh, the right of forgetting. Uh, I think the, and the second one is, the position of enunciation. I think. I think for Chi, uh, the reason why to ask this two questions. Uh, I think, in, in particularly because this exhibition is in Hong Kong, which I think enunciation and languages are part of this legacy, or forgotten legacy of so in relation with communism or the leftist leaning social um, and political movements um, and the language in itself. Uh, what I'm referring to is the Official Language Act in 1974, which is in fact a result of the student movement in the 1970s. 
which is group of students, uh, Hong Kong students coming together and ask for uh, an official document in official court cases can be speaking in Chinese rather than in English. I think that said a really sad departure between Singapore and Hong Kong, which uh, the notion of autonomy is a very interesting and sensitive topic when it comes to languages uh, and Mandarin as well. Um, and again, what happened when we failed an attempt to make association with the past opposition? And I think that's, a, that, that's really a question when I arrived in Hong Kong, coming in via the Airport Express, looking at the vacuum, the vacancy on the street, which just happened, the biggest protest a day ago. What are the relationship with those resistance? And what are the failed linkages that uh, I mean, as a historian, as a historian, I try to make association between all these different movements in Hong Kong. And I think the question comes back to Chi Ying. Because the beauty of the video is, oh, uh, spoil a bit. <laughs> um, the beauty of the images, uh, the videos behind this, is really how Chi Ying, I would say, I think with that effective momentum coming from him, personal, family history of this notion of absence, how to suture the different songs and different absent moments of this poetic forgetting of a particular generation. Uh, suture these different songs together became one single, I think, sonic driven movie images behind this. What's your take? And what's your first in, like as, the aspirations to really bring those political songs and propaganda songs together and really turn into a present act of memories of you and form a relationship with the past opposition and resistance to try to rethink <coughs> with and through this notion of decolonization and about this particular video, which is the beauty of memory precisely situated in this moment of forgetting of most the lyrics of a particular generation. Oh, I, I mean, uh, just a I mean, very short comment to say that the story, Chinese story that Wang was told, is really fascinating, I think, you know, sort of brings me to this, uh, you know, uh, old French, um, I mean, European way of uh, uh, sort of talking about um, the king's too much, the king is dead, the king is alive. And this, in this case, it's the rabbit is dead and the rabbit is alive, right? And it's just, you know, even though he's being you know, kind of banished, he's dead, right? And he's uh, sort of haunting uh, in that regard. And, and so, in, in that sense, you know, this is a party way of it. Yeah. In terms of the video installation, um, it's of um, two songs in, by, in video and then um, another song just audio. Uh, so my thinking with this is, um, as I said earlier, it's allowing them, these participants of this war to reclaim these memories for themselves and their own voice. Um, in this particular version, I've decided to cut different people singing the same song together, almost as a memory relay, passing of the baton kind of an effect. And what I found interesting was when these memories then overlapped and what happens when that happens. I mean, when, obviously I made the videos over several years and across different places, you know, there were singers from uh, Hong Kong, Guangdong province, Southern Thailand, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and how this came about was after all my long oral history interviews, I will ask if these old people remember any of the songs from this movement 70 years ago. And some people did. I mean, some people sang these songs every morning in the movement. Um, so then I would just set the camera up and, and film. And sometimes you see them lapsing into um, forgetting. And that became very interesting for me. Um, some of it, some some of those episodes were 
very moving. Um, when you see them sort of searching deep in the recesses of their brains to, to remember. So um, I won't say too much about it. I think it is more of an emotional experience that you might want to just um, step in there and feel if you feel it. I mean, it's just one of those things that's hard to articulate. But my thinking really was about letting them reclaim those memories. Um, and uh, we actually have Mr. Turn here, who is 100, and I think he would like to sing us the songs later. Um, I'll just say a bit about what the songs are. So on this screen, on the side of the room, is the International, which many people will recognize as the anthem of the Socialist Movement Worldwide. Um, this was translated into Chinese, and with some words transliterated into Chinese. Um, and this song on this side of the room is Goodbye Malaya. Um, and these songs, I didn't know at the time when I recorded them, but um, in talking to more of the participants of this war and doing much more historical research, I realized that there's an additional significance to these songs. The International was not just the anthem that they sang every morning in the movement, it was also the song that the Malayan communists who had been imprisoned and put on death row would sing just before, just as they stepped up to the platform to be hanged. They would sing it almost in defiance. And then Goodbye Malaya, Kopia Malaya, is a song that was written in 1941 by two Malayan communists and um, was the song that the deportees sang as they stood on the decks of the ships being sent away from Malaya and Singapore to be returned to China at the height of the emergency. So, I mean, the political significance gives it a different kind of an emotional power somehow. Um, if there's a, if I've actually had a very long conversation, and I hope we'll open up to the audience afterwards. But uh, just uh, for, as an interview, I just want to say that um, what Qian has brought to us, uh, one can say there are forensic evidences of you know, some violent struggles, which is actually not this way. And uh, we, in fact, are not too sure if the coup is we've got our real ones. And we actually are not too sure if the crimes they've been accused of um, are really the um, are really the end of the story, but they actually have not on the wrong trail. So uh, I hope we'll uh, rethink this uh, issue, this political and resolve problems of uh, the Malayan emergency. And uh, now we just want to conclude this, uh, uh, this section. If any of you would like to continue to have a conversation with Chi afterwards, uh, we might be able to continue. Uh, so I would like to introduce Thank you very much. Oh, I'm under your souls. Very old. Huh? <laughs> I can explain this well, but I speak Chinese. It's better. Oh, my God. 
，我们有共同的目标，我们有共同的信仰，在共同目标在前进，好像破分离一样。所以唱起歌来，再回来就说，把圣日本呢，啊，能够胜利的，很高兴。这好唱的，唱起我们的歌来，不要为别的也悲哀。我们是时代的主人，伟大的主人，在身上，我们有共同的理想，我们有共同的心。在共同的目标上前进，好像不完美一样。这样子，大队下来了，回来就是唱什么？圣地歌，把圣日本啊，拿了很多武器，挑了很多武器，回到圣地里，碰到我们队伍。歌词怎么唱给你们听呀？哎，你这里，亲爱的同志，有你在那些什么？是神的朋友，是上帝的朋友，会快乐快乐，欢迎我们前的同志，会快乐快乐，欢迎我们前的同。亲爱的同志，哟，你带的是什么？是好消息哟，是神的朋友。所以快来快来，欢迎我们亲爱的同志。所以快来快来，欢迎我们亲爱的同志。Thank、you.